Looks like you've been missing a lot of work lately. I wouldn't say I've been missing it, Bob. (laughs) Welcome to the Speak Up Podcast. My name is Ray Gillenwater, and this is Work Smart, the podcast where we tell you all about how to be more productive, efficient, and effective at work. Today, we are joined by special guest Jay O'Brien, whom I met through my friend Elizabeth Doe. And Jay is an entrepreneur and in the real estate business. And um, we met up over lunch a week or two back, and I thought he had a pretty cool story. So, Jay, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, man. So we have a lot of similarities that are that are really uncanny. I mean, it, so we were we kind of grew up in the same county, the same music scene, and um, it makes sense that there are some similarities. But the similarities that we share are really weird because I mean, we even have the same tattoo artist. Right. Uh, yeah. We went to or uh, yeah, went to the same college, same tattoo artist. We both know Liz. And then we just found out that we both know Dan O'Leary, whom we just had on the podcast as well, our friend from Box, who, by the way, I I don't know from real life. I met him via the internet and now we're friends. So that's, that's even more coincidental, but, um, very small world, but yeah, man, cool to have you on the show. And we're also joined by my brother, our VP of tech ops, the, the guy always uh, referred to on the podcast, Ben Gillenwater. So hello, Ben. Yep. Hey guys, how you doing? You know, Ray, I was just thinking that uh, when you say you met somebody on the internet, you know, you might want to specify the channel by which that happened. Grinder, because because yeah. okay, no, because I assumed right, but let's let's give the shout out to Grinder where it's due. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and just for those that don't understand our personality, and Dan, I'm sure you have a significant other. We're, we're joking. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, Dan, we just roped you right into that one. Yep. Um, I think I mentioned on on his episode that Dan found us from Product Hunt because Dan is all over Product Hunt, and um, we found that out actually because he's using that tool. What's that tool you use in, in for inbox? Oh, I think it's called Mixmax. Mix Have you heard Max? of that, Jay? No, it's this rad uh, email tracker. You can oh, what's set it called Mixmax. Mixmax. It was on Product Hunt a few weeks ago, and you can like helps you set appointments with people. And the I day after it was on Product Hunt, he sent me an email and it said sent from Mixmax. So he's he's all over Product Hunt, man. He's he's a good he's, dude. He's all, he's all over anything that is tech. Like he's just all over it, man. He's such a smart guy. Yeah. Um but yeah, Jay, back to uh back to you, man. Tell us tell us your story. So the the thing that fascinated me most is that um I always love when people kind of go after their true passion in life. And um, you were working at Best Buy for a bit. And I think it was even at the time when I was managing Best Buy as an account. And I would go into some of the Best Buy stores to check in on BlackBerry sales and before that Verizon sales. Um, so you you went from that job, which I'm sure wasn't your dream job, to now kind of running your own show. And you have your own office with your own staff. And it sounds like you're doing really well. So Dude, I'd Dude, love to hear your story. Yeah. Tell, tell us yeah, uh, how you started. started. Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll try and make it the nutshell version. But basically, in 2000, 2003 to 2009, I worked for Best Buy and worked my way up through uh, retail management uh, pre and post college. Got my degree in economics in 2008. And then <clears throat> I realized that I was going up this path in retail, making more and more money, which was great. Being in my early 20s, um, actually was able to purchase my first home at 23 because of um, all the options available through Best Buy, through their stock purchase plan, all that stuff. And it was great. But I knew that inevitably I would not want to continue to grow in the retail sector because you would essentially be trapped, right? You'd continue to go. And by the time I was 30, I'd be making 150 grand a year. And if I ever want to leave, like, there's nowhere I'm going to go and make 150 grand unless it's in retail. So I made a very conscious decision to get out of it and take a uh, significant pay cut at the time to go do what I thought I wanted to do, which was work in corporate America, uh, which is actually how I met Dan O'Leary. But um, I got hired at this company, this software development company based out of Long Beach, and it was the biggest kick in the nuts that I ever had in my life. <laughs> um, it was amazing, actually, because... Um, you know, had the job been a little bit better, little better culture, little better pay, I probably would would have been complacent for much longer. But it was just the fucking worst. <laughs> like, I, can I cuss on this show? Oh, you want, and you already have, so whatever. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's just it's just what happens. Free speech, my friend. Whatever you want to say is fine. Okay, so so to give you an idea, um, I, so I left March twenty. Um, 10 was when I started this job at the software development company as an account manager, um, making about two thirds of what I was making at Best Buy. So I took a pay cut. I go to work there. First day of work, I get in and this guy comes up to me. He's a manager there and he goes, Hey, you're the, you're the new guy. And he points me out. I'm like, yeah, Hey, I'm Jay. Nice to meet you. I go to shake his hand and he looks down at my hand and he goes, 
I'm not going to shake your fucking hand. Whoa. Yeah. So just like that, man. That's that, And that set the tone for the company culture. That, this was in California? This sounds like some kind of boiler room New York or Boston experience. It, it was where all of the people who were never the cool kids wanted their chance to be the cool kids as adults. So this guy was on a career path to become a cop. He failed the exam and then <laughs> exactly. got, got this job. Yeah, and it all cascaded down from the top, you know, all of the, all of the um, management team, everyone, it was basically like the bigger of a dick you could be, the faster you'll get promoted. I know it sounds ridiculous because I'm sure there's plenty of people who complain about their jobs, but this that's a true story. I mean, there's other stories where, you know, there's outside vendors that we worked with that we would see at a conference and I would introduce them to higher ups at my company like, oh, so-and-so, meet so-and-so. This is the guy we've been working with for the last year, um, wanted to put a face to the name and they'd be like, okay, nice to meet you, bye. And then the executive at my company would look at me and say, what the hell is wrong with you? Like, what do you, what makes you think that guy can shake my hand? And, um, (laughs) yeah, that arrogant personality. And it was just the most toxic fucking environment I ever worked in. It was horrible. And I had, I had been aggressively looking for a new job since the day I started. Um, but again, I didn't want to make another mistake. So I didn't just leave to go to any company. I interviewed all over the place. Nothing ever worked out. Um, at the time, I've Dude, always- I, I, sorry, I have to pause you there. We got to We got to hone on this a bit. Okay, um, please. Uh, so if you're not comfortable, I understand. But if you'd like to name and shame these guys, feel free to name the company. I, I was just wondering, I was like, should we go there? Damn, do I want to do don't that? You don't have to. No pressure at all. If you want to, feel free. I mean, last I, I four like, of the social. I feel like companies that, that behave like this should should have a, a spotlight shown on them. You know what? I I I agree with that. And they they try and recruit very heavily on Career Builder and a number of those sites. And they um, on paper look like an like a Google esque type of company around employee culture and employee health. They're very much not. So, as a service to the people listening to this, if you're looking for a job and you see the company Laserfish in Long Beach. Just move forward and do not go to that company. Oof. And and I, I must say, if you go on, um, was it Glassdoor, that website? I was just wondering what their Glassdoor is. Yeah. If you go to any any person who has ever worked there before, they will all tell you the same exact thing. So this is not just like a poor experience on my end. And one of the reasons why I want to pause you there, too, is part of the vision behind Speak Up is trying to create a more positive work environment. And this hierarchical, arrogant, I'm better than you type mentality is the exact opposite of everything we stand for at a DNA level. And it's so frustrating to hear about. And the fact that it's 2015 and these people in their jobs think they can use their titles and positions of power to subject other people to bad behavior, talk down to them, treat them like shit and make their lives hell because it makes them feel better is frankly disgusting to me. I know we joke about it, but it really pisses me off. And it's bad, um, man, yeah. it's really bad. So I, I'm, I'm glad that, um, that it was that bad of an experience for you because it caused you to leave and it caused you to be successful and do what you're doing now. But I, on the other hand, I'm just, I'm upset that that exists, especially in the tech industry. I mean, I, I've heard about this kind of thing. If you're, um, you know, if you're selling stocks or if you're, um, you know, working for a hardcore sales organization, selling like life insurance or like cars or something, but to have that kind of a mentality and corporate culture in a software business is is even more infuriating so well, and what, what's maddening to me is how hard it is to start a business and to get customers and to grow revenue and stuff right and think about the difficulty that entails and to think that there's these guys out there that have done that but can still exist maybe even succeed financially by treating people like that Right. Yeah. So their, their whole thing is that, you know, they recruit the type A personalities. I was one of two people who graduated from a Cal State school. Everyone else was either UC or Ivy League. Um, and we're all making 35, 40 grand a year and being treated like dog shit. And the thing is, when you recruit a type A personality and you berate that type A personality, most people that have never been in the workplace before, which was not me, but almost everyone else there, this was their first job they're thinking, what do I do to earn your approval? So they just work harder, you know? And for me, I'm like, fuck this place. No, we're from the punk rock music scene. There's no way we're going to deal with that type of authoritarian bullshit. It's, it's not going to happen. Exactly. So that's that was the environment. And like I said, it was a blessing in disguise because had I been paid a little bit more and the company culture wasn't quite as bad, I probably would have accepted it for a lot longer for this is what it is. Um, 
but it was great that it was as bad as it was because I hated going to work. Um, I mean, I dreaded every single moment of it. I was writing more than I've ever written in my life, both music and blog posts at the time, just venting. I was reading more than I ever had in my life, just any type of escape. And then eventually that's kind of what was the tipping point is that I was reading at the time a lot of uh, Gary Vaynerchuk stuff. I was reading Crush It had just came out. I was reading that book. I was reading The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss, which had come out in 2007, but I was reading it in 2010. Uh, the book Rework, uh, just a bunch of different um, books that got me thinking, this is this is crazy. What am I doing? I need to get the hell out. And not only do I need to leave this place, but I don't want to work for anyone else ever again, period. Mm. Yeah. Nice. Good books, man. Rework, we were just talking about, that was somebody last night. It's it's uh, for our work week too. Like those two books for me. And yeah, I read it back, I think back in 07 when it came out, it just totally blew my mind. So good. yeah, I had, a, I had a few books, multiple copies on my desk during my days at BlackBerry that were available almost as like a library to my team and to the extended team. Um, for our work week was one of them rework and then execution by Larry Bossidy. Those, those are kind of my three go-to books for, for how to think about business. Totally. So good stuff, man. When, when, um, how long did it take you to realize I cannot put up with this anymore? Um, it's too terrible to be complacent and I need to make a move. So here's what happened. Um, this company was also notorious for um, offering promotions with no equity adjustment, so to speak. Um, so they brought me in twice prior to this and really, you know, boosted my ego. Hey, we want to bring you up to the next level. We want to promote you, whatever. Well, really what they want to do is they want you to take on a shitload more responsibility and have a bunch of accountability behind that for no change in, in pay. Um, and I had come from a, a work environment for the last eight years. So I, I've been employed since I was 14, never a gap in my employment. Um, so I'm like, dude, I'm not playing that game. So I declined two promotions. And then on round three, they basically said, you need to take this. And if you don't, it's going to look really, really badly for you. Um, and more or less threatened me. So I knew that my days there were numbered, so I basically set up this deal where I was, I was put, I was given an opportunity to go to Thailand um, through a friend, and that would have been the third week of vacation for that year, and you're only allowed two in this corporate America world, right? So I said, look, here's the deal. I'll take it. I'll do it if you give me one week, and the week can even be unpaid. And they said, okay, no problem. That day, I uh, went went home. I booked the trip to Thailand, and then on Monday, they the, my boss called me in, and he goes, "You know, um, we changed our mind. We're not going to do it. It's only two weeks." So I said, "Well, I don't know to tell you. I already booked this trip." And he goes, "Well, then one of your other trips is going to have to go." The other trip was a family vacation I've taken every year since I was two years old. It's down in San Diego. It's far more important than anything else going abroad, anything to me, um, especially at the time my grandma um, was sick. I believe it was the last year I spent with her down there. So that, that was crystal clear. It's like, well, now this guy's trying to rob me of time with my family. Fuck this place. I'm out. And so you're legitimately making me angry right now. Yep. Hearing the story. Yep. So, th so that, that for me was like, okay, I'm done. Um, so what I did is I decided I'm going to get into real estate and it's, it's interesting for me. Dude, I got to pause you there again. I'm sorry. Go ahead, please. I'm, by the way, I'm glad you love Thailand. I love Thailand. Thai yeah, food, yeah. Thai boxing can't beat the place. In fact, our, our tattoo artist, Jim Miner came to Thailand when I was training in Phuket and tattooed me in my hotel room. And we have a lot of awesome stories that we'll share another time. That's I didn't realize fantastic. it's Jim. Jim. Jim tattoos Jay as well. Oh, yeah. I got my leg done by Jim. Oh, cool. Very cool. <laughs> so bizarre. But um, so, so sometimes it's easy to sit on the sidelines and talk about what companies shouldn't do. And um, in fact, we just spoke about this on the podcast with Karn Ross. It's values and what you stand for. And those things only mattering when you have the ability to show them with action, to, to actually demonstrate your true values. The, the Karn's, a, he's a British diplomat. So we used a political example, like the U.S. has a value not to torture people, um, except for in the case of the Bush administration when there was a, a short term gain. So they gain rather. So they got rid of that value temporarily and, and ended up doing that terrible thing. So it's not truly a value if you don't demonstrate it. Right. So in reference to your experience and how um, clearly your company didn't value people and their free time and work-life balance and all these things. I'd like to say that we do a speak up and I want to share a quick story. Um, so Alex Turpin, one of our developers, French Canadian dude, total badass, super smart, young guy, professor, uh, expert marksman, just a really interesting guy. 
we were getting ready for um, a really important push on the on the product side, and he was integral in that timeline. Um, <clears throat> and he he came to me with a question that he thought the answer would be no to, but he it, clearly it was important enough for him to ask me. It was, hey, I have this opportunity to go to Spain with this girl I'm dating, basically for free, and we can stay in this awesome historic place. It's going to be a couple week trip. Um, I know we have some important stuff to do at work. Uh, and I, I think the answer is no. And, and it probably doesn't make sense for me to go, but can I go? And actually that decision wasn't mine at the time. It was Keith's, but Keith was, um, unreachable. I think he was on vacation at the time or something. So I needed to make the choice at the time so that he could determine his travel schedule. And so I thought to myself, if I was in his shoes, what would I want to do? Would I really give a shit about pushing some additional lines of code to hit some arbitrary date? Um, to make sure that the business is on track. I mean, yeah, that's important. But when I'm 60 years old and I'm looking back at my life, am I going to remember that sprint and, and hitting that deadline? Or am I going to remember a vacation I took with a beautiful girl to Spain? So that, that's kind of the way I look at it. And then the answer became clear to me. I said, dude, go, go take your vacation. Um, I don't know how we're going to figure it out, how we're going to get it right, but there's got to be a way to do so and we'll adjust stuff. We'll make it happen. And Alex took the trip and he was forever grateful. And he's been the most loyal, most amazing employee ever since and was before. So I think it just comes down to having that relationship that's crucial. Like it's, it's an employee employer relationship. It's not you work for me. You're my slave. This is what you do, whether you like it or not. It's, Hey, this is an arrangement. There's give and take. There's a balance. I provide you with some things. You provide the company with some value and that's how it works. And as soon as that, that balance comes out of sync, is when you have a huge problem. And I truly believe that the whole dynamic that you expressed at, what was the, the terrible name of that company again? Laser Fish. Laser Fish. Yeah. I'm just annoyed by the name. Um, <laughs> that, that sort of approach to managing people, I think will die because it has to. It has to. And our generation just will not stand for it. That's it. You hit the nail on the head. Our generation won't stand for it. And now the people that are left on the sidelines and, and the baby boomer generation and all the stuff that from the industrial revolution and all this stuff that's, that's now over, you know, it's like it lasted for so long. And now we're in the information age and we got the millennials coming up and we're not teenagers anymore. We're not in our early twenties anymore. Now we're actually making a big footprint in, in all these industries across America. It's like, what the fuck is happening? We're taking over, my friend. But anyways, I keep interrupting you, for which I apologize. But please, please continue. So what happened from there? So, so yeah, I decided to get into real estate. And it's interesting because um, I, I've always been discouraged to do so. And especially at this time, it was 2011. And um, we were just coming off of the, the recession and whatnot. Um, my, my father comes from a, um, a background where he kind of is the traditional, you know, come from nothing, work your way up, um, in a W2 world and then, and then get on top. So he actually became the CEO of a, a very large company. Um, but still it was not entrepreneurial success, right? It was, it was not more, it was not a risk that he took. It was just work your ass off and get rewarded and climb the, the, the rungs of the corporate ladder. And we're not really in that world anymore. You know, I mean, in some extent, I guess we could be, but there's, there's hardly any security in that. So it had taken me several times to like bounce these ideas off of people. Um, and then I realized I'm never going to have this support. Um, people are never going to say, yeah, take the risk and do it. And I think, and I've talked a, a bit about, um, about this on my podcast too. I think that generally speaking, people don't want you to take, the risk, not because they're fearful that you'll fail. I think they're fearful that you will succeed mm -hmm. and they don't want you to do that mm -hmm. because then you've left them behind. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and not saying that's the case of my father, but like with friends, family, just in general, I think that that's, that can be the case, but I had been putting up with something that they have not been putting up with. And that was working at this shit job. So I, I did everything I could. I got my real estate license as fast as humanly possible. Literally you could not have done it one day sooner. Mm. Um, I, I had hit every timeline. And then what I did was, um, I knew that I would need cash flow in order to sustain my life. I had a mortgage to pay at the time, a car payment and everything. So I couldn't just leave and then see what happened. Remember I was making 40 grand a year. I didn't have the savings account that was built up yet. So I had to go to an environment where I could get cash flow and still have the time to do real estate, which brought me 
back to Best Buy. Mm. So I went back to Best Buy, which was an extremely humbling experience, right? And which is awesome, by the way, because it takes it takes a lot to be able to take a step back because you know you're about to take several steps forward. I remember being uh, there on my first day back. I'm wearing this Best Buy blue shirt. I'm greeting customers, and I remember thinking in my head what the fuck did I just do? <laughs> and it was just super eye-opening to me. And what I what I had to remind myself of constantly is you're putting yourself in a position to see your vision through. And so what I did was I would work two eight-hour days a day. So I'd work at Best Buy full-time. And then because I was a manager there, I could set up my schedule to work on a Saturday, 2 p.m. to 10 p.m., which means I'd wake my ass up early and I'd do real estate 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. Whoa, and, nice. And I would do that, and I did that for eight months um, until I finally was so busy with real estate that I was taking breaks every 10, 15 minutes to go outside and be on the phone. Um, my lunch break, I was on my computer constantly, and I, I was just like, you know what, it's time to take the leap. And so I just I left there. I became a full-time agent in um, March 2012. I was the very first agent at Remax Prestige, which was a um, a company that a mutual friend of ours had uh, had started, and um, I was the first agent. And then after about a year doing that, um, him and I became partners, fifty fifty. We now own two franchises, have about twenty three agents, an in house escrow company, three employees, and we're freaking hitting it hard. If my hands weren't full right now, I'd be clapping for you, man. That is uh, <laughs> thanks. That is thanks. a badass and inspiring story. I like that Thank a you. lot. Because you um, you swallowed your pride, you had that you had that humility, you had a vision of where you wanted to go. You knew it would require some serious work. You weren't afraid of that work. You put it in, you saw it through, and you made it happen. That's the stuff that really motivates me. So thanks for sharing the story, man. You know the tr- the tricky part of that whole thing is that. Um People often make decisions based off of money, and what happened was when I left Laserfish, they had um, they had now um, magically had a position available for me in their inside sales department, which would have paid more than double what I was earning. So um, it would have been that that magical hundred thousand dollar number that everyone reaches for, right? So um, they're like, "Look, you're 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 going to make a hundred grand if if you if you stay here." Um, and I remember the my broker and my business partner now. At the time, I had met him. In fact, I had never met him in person at this point. Just talked to him once on the phone. And I remember um, I had the option to go to Best Buy, making back to 40 grand or something like that. And uh, and then this option to stay on board for, for six figures. And I called him and I just said, I got one question for you. What is more valuable in real estate to have two days off on the weekend, two days off during the week? And he said, two days off during the week. Okay. That's all I need to know. That means I'm going to Best Buy and I'm forfeiting the, the income. Awesome. I think the other important thing to, to gather from that is not being for sale. I think not being for sale is a really empowering thing. I've had some big cash offered to me to stay in certain jobs and it's, uh, it's really scary to walk away from it. And it's, it's a, a kind of a harrowing experience to, to think about what you might be giving up in terms of your future. But when you can say no to someone trying to to basically make a financial transaction for for your life and your happiness, when you get to walk away from that, that's a very empowering experience. So it's cool to hear that you did that too. Yeah, it was it was definitely the right choice. And then um, and then w- once I got to Best Buy, it, it happened again. Two months later, I had my district manager come in. Um, you know, we had basically turned that that store around, and and then it was another thing. Best Buy is a great company. I have nothing bad to say about them. That they, they've they've always done right by me and um, offered me a promotion similar to the one that Laserfee should offered um, with with a big bump up. And um, again, I had to I had to decline that because I knew that that would not be eight hour days. Those would be 10, 12 hour days, maybe six days a week. And there would be no space to get into real estate. So, you know, that's that's the whole thing is you can't make decisions based on money, because at the end of the day, if you're if you're not doing what you really want to do. And and when you have a vision in place, you have to see that thing through like you owe it to yourself, you know, and and thank God that I did, because now it's just it's far better than any of those jobs could have been. You got to stick to the plan. That's right. Good stuff, man. That's super cool to hear. Let's talk about your industry for a second, um, because we we spoke about this briefly over lunch, and you know my feelings on your industry, and and it sounds like we we agree a little bit. But 
I kind of feel like real estate is the industry for um, people that are kind of lost. And it's like, well, I don't know what I'm doing with my life. I don't know where I'm going. Um, so I'm going to go into real estate. And there's a bunch of clowns in the industry. And um, I, I, there is a question coming from this. I'm not just going on a rant, I swear. Keep going. But, I like it. <laughs> but I, uh, my friend Liz, whom, whom introduced me to you, is an exception to that rule. And I have a lot of respect for her because of that. She's a true professional. She's on her game. She moves units. She gets stuff done. She helped me uh, short sale my place when I moved to Singapore for BlackBerry. She's helped Ben and a number of my friends sell and buy homes. And she's really damn good. So I know for sure that if she was going to introduce me to you and you're also in her industry, that you would be another one of those really talented, qualified people. But what, what, number one, what is it about the industry that makes me feel that way? And how much truth is, is there to that? And then number two, um, if that is the dynamic, how do you separate yourself from the pack? And, and what's that process like in terms of getting started when there's all these, it's almost like actors in Hollywood where everyone in Hollywood's an actor, but you just have this group of claimers basically. And then you get a few that kind of um, rise to the top and then become professionals. So help, help me out with that if you don't mind. So, so your perception is, is basically a hundred percent true. Um, I always call real estate the cosmetology of business. You know, it's like the people that are lost and no offense to those in that are in the cosmetology world, but it's a similar thing. It's like, I don't know what to do. So because I don't know what to do or because I don't want to work hard, what I'll do instead is just do something that requires a very low barrier of entry. Um, and, you know, people that, for example, I, I don't even believe in college, to be honest with you anymore. I have a degree, but like that's kind of irrelevant. I think people will just say, I don't know what to do. So instead of doing something, I will just do nothing until I figure it out. And then one day they realize that years have gone by and I'm going to, I'm going to get into this and that could be something with a low barrier to entry. I think in real estate, it's especially appealing because people look at these commission checks and they go, holy shit, you know, like you made $15,000 on that sale. I should do this. Okay. Do it really, really easy to get your license and to officially on paper be able to do it, which I think is the scariest thing ever. Um, but when you said, what do you do to set yourself apart? Um, if you can read and write, you've already set yourself apart big time. Um, <laughs> and you know, it actually doesn't take a whole lot. It's, it's very, the industry is very hard. Okay. To, to get rolling, build the momentum, be good at it. Like anything should be hard, right? Like, but the reason why I say, um, setting yourself apart is not that difficult is because if you're just a good person, like that is honest and ethical and says it does what they say they're going to do, that alone is, is less than 10% of the industry. That alone. My first year in the business, 50% of my transactions came from someone who already had a realtor. I didn't pick them off. They contacted me and said, my realtor won't call me back. Unreal. I once sold a house that the realtor that they had prior to me showed the house. The, the client wanted to write an offer on the house and they were just waiting on the paperwork from the realtor and a week had gone by, no return phone calls. This person was referred to me and, I, and I, I'm, as I'm learning about it, I'm like, so hold on, you've already seen this house? You told your agent you want to write an offer? You still haven't heard back? Well, let's write the offer. We did. I sold that house. We never heard again from the realtor. The realtor probably had uh, appointments at the salon. Man. <laughs> she, <laughs> probably, she must have. And that's like free money for that realtor. Like the deals, the work's done. Right. And that's I mean, another well, thing when it comes to right. um, making decisions based on money. It's another thing in the industry that statistically in Orange County, you've got 90% of agents that sell no more than three homes in a whole year. Okay. 65% sell zero because that's how saturated it is. Anyone and everyone's got a license, right? Um, so the reason I bring that up is because when that one person does have a client, they hold on to it for dear life. So, you know, you and I are in escrow on a property and you're like, Hey Jay, what's up with like the roof? And I'm like, dude, the roof's fine. Don't worry about it. Like, you know, because all I'm thinking about is that commission check and that's written all over your face, man. You know, like the people that actually do business like Liz, you know, she's a true pro. She's built a, a business, you know, like real business. Um, like, you know, that anytime you have a question, you call Liz and you're going to get an honest answer. You're not, and she'll pick up the phone and she'll pick up the phone. Yeah. It's not going to be some bullshit of like, you know, trying to make a transaction happen out of a simple phone call. 
Yeah, I I, uh, I won't name the guy, but I, I had a boss who's hilarious. Um, and uh, the, the I, I guess the effect in business, which is common, is if you are exceptional, but only as compared to the people that are pretty terrible around you, um, he used to call me the tallest midget, which uh, which kind of brought me back down to earth. So anytime I, I would get any accolade for for doing something great, he would just kind of like, hey, remember who you're competing against. And that, that was always the thing that blew me away. I mean, um, I, I've never been in real estate, but in business in general, I, I've um, received some awards and recognition and bonus checks along the way. And especially in the early days, I would always think to myself, I'm just doing my job. I got an award for doing my job. I mean, I'm literally like checking off the boxes on my job description and just fulfilling it to like a pretty reasonable level of competence. And that's worthy of recognition. And that, that whole dynamic is what, um, is what prompted me to, to try to work really hard and kind of take that kick ass W2 approach that was it your dad took yeah, in, yeah. in business. And that, that helped me climb the ladder and get a lot of stuff done because I feel like there's a lot of complacency in business and, and people want to do the bare minimum. And I feel like if you do what's required of you instead of the bare minimum, or if you even go above and beyond that and try and find avenues for other opportunity, you can be wildly successful. Um, so it sounds like you use the same kind of mentality in, in real estate. Yeah. And if you've ever been in a management position before, you know, like prior to being in that role, the idea of being a manager sounds like the best thing ever. You're like, this is going to be easy. I'm going to be able to just manage a bunch of people like me. And then you realize no one's got that work ethic and it's like babysitting. You know, one of the things my dad always said, I thought was hilarious. He'd say, yeah, management's great. The only thing that's wrong with it are the people. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I have a new rule that I've just, um, I've just came up with in my head, which is uh, I don't ever want to be a manager um, if I can't control who's on the team. Because I don't want to manage people that aren't motivated or don't care. I want to manage people that believe in the vision and, and want to spend their hours that they're dedicating to work doing awesome stuff. And there are plenty of people out there like them. And one of the things I, I love about business is figuring out who those people are, getting them bought into the vision, getting that, that infectious sense of enthusiasm and building that together into some kind of cohesive team that works together to get amazing things done. And that, that, that kind of thing just creates this high that everyone can ride on. And if you can keep it going, it's, it's when you can truly create things that are spectacular. So, so yeah, good stuff, man. I, I, um, yeah, I, I feel the same way. Like it's, you know, you feel like yeah, you get into a management position and you're like, Oh God, what, you know, what have I found myself in? Uh, so Jay, now that you've, you've built this business with your, with your business partner, um, what do you do to try to recruit people that are good. Cause I mean, that's always the hardest part is like you write a job description you go out and you find, you know, you put, you kind of market the job in places where you think people will be that will fit it and you interview them and they say all the right things and they show up in the nice suit or the nice, you know, dress or whatever. Um, that just is, you know, even, even companies like you mentioned, you know, like a Google esque culture kind of thing, even Google struggles, right? Like it's, it's so hard because people will bullshit and do whatever it takes, obviously, to get the job. Have you found a recipe or any kind of yeah. repeatable thing? Yeah, that's that works? a great question. So in the real estate industry, things work a little bit differently when you own a brokerage. So when you own a brokerage, um, everyone in there, they're independent contractors. And so they're not W-2 employees. You're not paying them. And, you know, to Ray's point, you know that statistically you're going to lose on most of them. Um so what most brokerage business models do as their operation is they recruit very, very heavily. If you've got a license and a pulse, you're hired. And it's basically almost like the angel investor approach. So if I can open up a warehouse that will house 100 or 200 agents, I know that statistically 90% of them are going to not do well, right? Well, everything works off of commission splits. So the, those people, those 90% that sell one house a year, two, three houses a year, the brokerage is going to take 50% of their commission, okay? So if you multiply that times 100, it actually can be really profitable, Um and then the people that are your heavy hitters, you're going to get, you know, five, ten percent uh, margins off of them, and you'll win in volume. That's kind of like your portfolio of agents, if you will. That's how most brokerages operate. If you got your license today and you can call Century Twenty One, Keller Williams, Remax, anyone, they'll hire you. Like they'll actually ask you to work there. Um, that's not how ours works because there's 
there's zero guidance in that model, right? So you just have a bunch of people that are potential liabilities in my eyes, you know, like people just running all over the place, putting offers together, like going off of bad habits, bad advice. And um, it just sounds like a nightmare to me. So what we did instead, me and my business partner, is we created um, early on this this mentor program. We call it Accelerate. And we bring on only agents that we are ready to dedicate our time to. Because it takes a lot of time for the, to guide someone in, in doing real estate the right way and teaching them um, the ethical behaviors and the code of ethics, the MLS rules, regulations, like how to get the client. How the, how the client signs up with you, the whole bit. And, um, you know, the truth of the matter is we're not willing to take the time with, with most people, you know, for probably 12, 14 interviews we do, we hire maybe one person. Um, and so that's kind of been our approach and it's grown very organically a lot. We don't recruit at all. Actually, it's very, very heavily referral based. So, um, whether it be through Facebook or people that have seen our success already and they want to be a part of it, they'll come in for an interview, but we know that we're going to have to train them really heavily for like the first year. And our goal is to get them to that that specific, you know, $100,000 income within one year of them coming on board. And then from there, they can kind of operate on their own. Nice. And um, I, I was curious. So now that you're in this this role and you're building the business and you have agents and things are rolling along, um, what's what's your typical week like these days? Like, how do you how do you split your time from kind of managing the business to doing deals yourself and just walk us through kind of how you work throughout the week. Yeah, so there's there's a few different things that I'm in charge of. So number one is the brokerage, right? So we've got about 20 agents that we're training and coaching and, and managing daily. There's an in-house escrow um, company that we started about a year and a half ago. So that's we have an employee there and an entire different operation running that we need to make sure is on track. Then there's the personal production side of things. So I'm still out there selling homes um, every Every day and doing doing that that takes up a, a bulk of my time. I run a podcast which is called Prestige Living, and then I have another um, entity called Buy with a Buddy, and this is essentially a separate seminar webinar esque thing around education on how to purchase your first home with a friend or significant other or colleague or whoever that be, rather than waiting to have the funds on your own. So it's all based around how does that happen. Um, so my time is is split up all over the place. But there are things, I mean, I'm a big proponent of time management. So, you know, when people say they're busy, that's great. But like, I'm, I'm pretty much never too busy for something because it's in my calendar, you know, so I don't kind of just let the day see where it goes. Everything is very mapped out. So around the coaching and mentoring side of it with the agents and employees, we have structured reviews, we have structured meetings, structured trainings. Um, so Every other Tuesday at 9 a.m., I'm doing a very specific training. Every other uh, Tuesday at 10 a.m., I'm doing a different training. Every Thursday at 8 a.m., there's a different coaching going on. Um, I have one-on-one scheduled with all the employees and all the agents, so um, there's not too much pulling me in a bunch of different directions. They actually have a predetermined scheduled time where they meet with me, so they can bring up anything they have to talk about at that time. Um, that kind of allows the time for me to to do the personal production side. And on the personal production side, there's an entire team in itself around that. I have a full-time buyer's agent who's showing the properties so that I have one specific individual who their responsibility is to have the time to go show these properties. You know, if I have six, seven buyers looking for property, it'd be impossible for me to go out and show them homes, right? So I have someone in charge of doing that. And then I have a full-time assistant and then um, our escrow officer. And then of course, my, um, my business partner as well. That is awesome, man. Because it seems like you have very clear priorities and then you have a process structure and a calendar that matches those things. And that's how you get stuff done. Um, which kind of had me thinking. You mentioned that you don't necessarily buy into the whole concept of college. I'm on the fence. I think it depends. Um, I think you certainly make a good point. Um, this whole structure and this approach that you take in your business is clearly working for you. And I'm, I'm a big proponent of that approach. Um, was it your education that that prompted you to operate in such a way? Was it your instinct or was it your experience at Best Buy or was it some blend of the three? You know, it's it's actually I probably attribute most of that stuff to actual work experience and the the biggest influencers in my life, which are the people who whose books I'm reading and podcasts I'm listening to and learning from their experiences. So a lot of the time management stuff that I've learned is is specifically from Tim Ferriss. Um uh, and as far as priorities go, daily routines, um, I also have a business coach that I hired um, 
about a year ago now. It's been about nine months, and, and he's helped tremendously with a lot of that sort of stuff. But really staying on track and prioritizing, you know, I'm a very, very punctual person. I'm never late. Basically, unless something happened, I'm never late. I think you rolled up to our 11 a.m. meeting this morning at 10.59. So this is uh, correct. you're demonstrating that. Nice work. Yeah, so so that's, you know, I just don't believe in that. Like, oh, sorry, this ran late. This, it's just, it that almost never happens if you're, if you're tight and right on your calendar, you know? But around the college thing, you know, for me, that's, my degree is in economics and, and I have a minor in business and that's cool. But I think that it's almost like a false sense of credibility. It's like, you know, you, I can... I hated school so much. It's going to sound funny, but I hated school so much that that's the reason I finished was because if I stopped and I said I hated it, it'd be like, well, of course you hate it. You didn't finish. But school one. Yeah, exactly. School one. So I would say, fuck that. I'm going to win. I'm going to get good grades, which I did. And I'm still going to say how much I hated it. Like now it's got some weight to it. Yeah, it's 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 a really terrible thing. And I certainly didn't coin this phrase, but um, I'll steal it handily. Um, I love learning, but I hate school. I left high school at 15 and a half um, as soon as I possibly could. I went to college. I uh, I spent nine years getting a four-year degree. It was a brutal experience that um, had had me really lacking in sleep, and, and the stress levels were, were through the roof as I was trying to work at the same time, all the way up through the BlackBerry days, by the way. I literally got my diploma right before the time I had to submit it to the Ministry of Manpower in Singapore to get a work permit. Um, so it was, it was a crazy experience. I'm glad that I went through it because I think it taught me what you learned when you were doing, um, the Best Buy stuff and the real estate stuff at the same time, you were doing double duty and that kind of schedule really helps you understand what you're made of and, and really helps you understand, um, are these priorities important enough for me to actually do them and go through the pain and the grind every single day for weeks, months, and years. So that's the main thing that I, that I took out of school in terms of, of value. Um, but we're short on time and I wanted to get into tech, especially since we have, uh, my, my tech savvy brother here, Ben. Um, so real estate strikes me as a tech dinosaur of an industry. It's, um, probably in the same category for me as like finance or healthcare. Um, and I remember back in the day, I would actually sell to real estate agents all the way back in the Verizon days, um, you know, Oh five, Oh six, and then at Blackberry as well. And it was not an easy task. Um, <laughs> these uh, Everything is manual. Um, MLS looks terrible. Ben has a side business, in fact, that helps with one minor problem that real estate agents deal with, which is photography. In 2015, where we have amazing ca- cameras, even in our pocket on our phones, you look at real estate listings, and they're terrible. They're so bad. So uh, it's probably just a reflection of the type of, of people that are involved in real estate generally, with the exception of killers like yourself and, and Liz. Um, but what what tech are you using that helps you throughout the week? Are you kind of taking your um, you know young millennial vibe and adding tech to the equation to get stuff done more efficiently? Or are you just kind of a, a victim of circumstance and do you have to sort of work through all the manual processes um, that are uh, accustomed to the industry already? Yeah, we. that's a great question. So we, we're a very heavy tech office. Um, so I'm 29 years old and my business partner is 33 years old. So we are probably among the, the, the youngest real estate um, brokers in probably all of Orange County, I would imagine. The average age of a realtor is 59. So even when it comes to things like Facebook that has been around for quite some time, about 11, 12 years now or something like that, um, and realtors that are in their 50s, 60s that are on, oh, I'm, I'm hip, I'm cool, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm tech driven, I'm on Facebook. That's great. It's good to see that people are using Facebook. They're using it in the wrong way. Mm -hmm. They're blasting people with listings and open houses and their success stories. And no one gives a shit. There's no... The shotgun strategy. Just throw it out there and see what happens. Shotgun strategy. uh, The right hook, if you will, uh, via Gary Vee. But... um, Yeah, it's that's not how you engage with people on social media. Um, But from like another side of things with tech, like for example, we don't use flyer boxes on uh, on for sale signs. We don't have flyers. Um, They're just pointless. You know, every time you look at a flyer box, there's none in there anyway. Even if there were some in there, what the hell is the point of it? Um, It's not going to help sell the house. Um, What we'll do is we will have a text to sign writer. So. 
you know, it'll say text four, five, six to one, two, three for information. And in 2015, people don't always want to call the realtor. So my number's there, but like lots of times they don't want, like they think they're, they're going to get the hard sell when they call me or that now they're on a list and I'm going to start calling them all the time or whatever. So if they do the text too, they're going to get what they want, which is a link to the, the single property website, one, two, three, maple street.com. And it's going to have all the photos, the HD video, you know, um, the floor plan. Like we actually pay for a floor plan to be created. Like I know it sounds crazy, but people want to see a floor plan, you know, mm-hmm. and they're going to see the bedroom count, bathroom count, square feet, price, all that stuff. And they all, they'll also have my information. That's a more effective quote flyer than actually having physical paper. Cause now I can see how many people have went to grab the flyer, you know, in a flyer box when they're empty and you had a hundred people go walk up to it. That's a hundred people you just lost potentially. But do you still use um, uh, two, two tactics, which are fantastic on those real estate flyers, really ridiculous adjectives like charming and, and things and, and all caps. Do you still do both of those things on the website or I've have you changed that as well? Things. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I like that. And I also like the, uh, the adjectives are like, you know, new water heater, new AC. It's like, <laughs> no one's going to your house. Like, dude, this is the one they got the new water heater. Like no one gives a shit about that, you know? Um, but getting into the reading and writing again, just knowing that an agent knows what charming means. That's pretty good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, on the tech side of stuff, we build out squeeze pages. We do a lot of Google pay per click. We do a lot of Facebook pay per click. Um, we're we're constantly on top of that stuff. We've created multiple proprietary websites in our own office that drive thousands of leads per month, literally thousands. I feel like you're almost cheating. I feel like you have an unfair advantage. It's the best. Um, and I, I I tip my imaginary hat to you, sir, because um, you're. I, I think you'll be wild wildly successful because you're you're applying process, diligence, and tech to an industry that badly needs all those things. And I feel like um, you're going to more than get your lion's share of business as a result. And it, it seems like you have been. So kudos to you, man. And, and thanks for coming on the podcast. It's been a super interesting Thank chat. Thank you, Ray. Appreciate it. So now is a time in the podcast where you can mention anything you'd like to mention that you haven't so far, if you forgot to say something that you wanted to, to talk about, um, and or if you'd like to give out your contact details. So if someone wants to buy a home from you, how can they find out more about you, about your, your business, about your podcast, whatever you want to talk about. Is sure. Favorite. Yeah. Um, I'd say, um, follow the podcast. It's called prestige living. You can find it on iTunes. We do three segments. One is, uh, interviewing entrepreneurs in Orange County. The other is a be bold segment, which is something that I release every Monday as an inspirational sort of thing. And then the third one is the real estate truths and myths where you can just learn a little bit more about certain topics in real estate. Um, you can find that prestige living um, again on iTunes. And then uh, for my personal contact information, I can be found on Instagram and on Twitter. My handle um, on both of those is anti-realtor. So anti-realtor on Twitter, anti-realtor on Instagram. And then uh, for any other inquiries, I can always be emailed at um, jay.obrien, O-B-R-I-E-N at remax.net. Awesome. Thanks, Jay. Amazing chat. As always, this podcast is sponsored by Speak Up. So if you want to create positive change at work, go to getspeakup.com, enter your work email address. You can post a problem. Anyone on the team can solve a problem. Everything is votable. Share a great idea. Ask a question. And the best part is management can then come in later and make decisions transparently for the whole team to see, which actually propels the business forward. We're also sponsored by our new product, Speak Up Live. So go to getspeakup.com slash live and host more intelligent meetings. If you're familiar with Google Moderator, it's that tool that Google discontinued that allowed anyone in a meeting to ask a question digitally, so not just the extroverts. Everyone can vote on questions, and then the moderator of the meeting answers the top-voted questions at the end of the session, making sure that the questions being answered are of the highest value and that less time is being wasted doing that manually. So thanks so much for listening to the podcast, and we will catch you next time.